Um, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me here. So the Carmel Academic Center, the Israeli Association for the Study of European Integration, the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation, and of course, uh, my dear friend Rachel Fried. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. When I started working on this topic about 12, 15 years ago, nobody was interested. It was quite depressing, uh, but there were no conferences, very few publications, nobody wanted to hear about this. And in just over a decade, um, this topic, investment law and investment arbitration, has not only captured, uh, not only led to a lot of uh, academic debate, a lot of political debate, but has captured the imagination of the broader public in a way that is quite unseen for something as technical and boring as um, investment law, at least as it was used to, to be seen. Now you have demonstrations of uh, hundreds and or thousands of people on the streets of, for example, Berlin against um, this treaty. It's often said of courts that um, justice must not only be done, it must also be seen to be done. And in this case, regardless of how the system currently functions, and I won't be elaborating on that, it's definitely not perceived as being a just system. And the response in the European Union in particular has been, well, let's just throw out the old system, let's develop a new one. And that new one is to be incorporated in the treaties that the EU is currently negotiating, for example, with the US, TTIP, there we go with the abbreviations, but also with Canada, also with Vietnam, with Korea, with Mexico, etc. So you might say, well, what's relevant for Israel? Well, it's not unthinkable that the EU would, uh, perhaps not tomorrow, but in the coming years, come with a similar proposal to Israel, because quite a number of uh, EU member states, um, 12 to be precise, I believe, yes, um, have actually one of these bits, one of these bilateral investment agreements with the old arbitration uh, system uh, with Israel. Germany, France, for example, but also Slovakia, Lithuania and a number of others. And then the question will be for Israel to decide, do we want to keep the old system, which has served Israel well, you've never, Israel has never lost a case, um, or do you want to jump on board with this new investment court system? In order to make that decision, of course, you will first have to know what this new system is about. I have selected a number of the critiques on the old system and what I would like to do with you is to decide whether this new system actually addresses these concerns and if so, whether some new problems are uh, or may be arising. Yes. The first stage, of course, is before you set up this system, what do you have to bear in mind or what, is, uh, what, what are the problems you might run into? And the first one is a very obvious one. Um, ICSID, which is the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, another one of these uh, abbreviations. ICSID is part of the World Bank. ICSID is also the registry office that um, deals with most of these claims. It's also the office that provides a convention that sets out the procedural rules. The EU is not even a member of ICSID. Um, Israel, on the other hand, is. So the first question is, how do we deal or what do we do with procedural rules? Do we want a new procedural treaty or somehow do we want to adapt the existing rules? The Commission has not solved this problem. The Commission refers to ICSID, but as any investment lawyer will tell you, the EU cannot participate as a party. The EU is not a state, although it's um, at times behaving like one. The problem is also procedural rules sounds technical, sounds boring, but can be absolutely crucial because it determines, for example, whether you can have an appeal or not. Can you appeal against the decision of this tribunal? Under the ICS, you can. Under the exit rules, this is prohibited. It also determines, for example, if you don't agree with or if you doubt the um, impartiality, the independence of one of your adjudicators, whether you call them judge or member, doesn't matter. If you doubt the impartiality of this person and you think that they might take a biased decision, you, know, you need to know which rules to apply. At the moment, that is not particularly with regard to this challenging of an adjudicator. These rules are not clear. These rules are not provided for, or not, at least not elaborately, in the um, ICS. 
So what we see is that the key, that there are key differences between the existing system and the new system. At least we assume there are key differences, but they're not uh, sufficiently worked out. Also, I doubt whether ICSID, because one of the reasons that ICSID is not liked is that it's part of the World Bank. Many people, at least in Europe, um, are very much against the World Bank system as a whole. So one thing that could be considered is, for example, to look into um, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which may take over some of the um, duties of ICSID, and I'd be happy if you have questions about that to explain further. The next element is that a lot of public uh, voices in the public opinion say, well, we don't believe uh, in the ethics, the ethical conduct of these arbitrators. They are ad hoc arbitrators, so they have another job. They do something else, and then once in a while, they, because of their expertise, are appointed to adjudicate a case. Um, we don't believe that these people are uh, sufficiently impartial. So what the Commission, the European Commission has done is they come up with this, as already mentioned, semi-permanent uh, adjudicatory body where they say, well, the members have to be uh, beyond doubt, they cannot be affiliated with any government and they cannot act as counsel or expert or witness in any other um, case. Now that is problematic for a number of reasons, the first one being that they add in a footnote, and I quote, for greater certainty this does not imply that persons who are government officials or receive an income from the government, but who are otherwise independent, are ineligible. Now if you think about this, if you receive money from a government, you are by definition affiliated with that government. That's not to say that you as a person can't be trusted, that's simply to say that if you have a financial interest in one of the parties, you should not be a judge. Another problem is that the proposal says that anyone who wants to be one of these judges cannot can no longer act as counsel, or expert or witness. Now in many countries, I have to admit I don't know this about Israel, but in many countries you cannot choose whether you're a witness or not. If you're called in court as a witness, then you have to appear. But you can, of course, choose whether to be an expert or a counsel, and this is what most of the people who are currently arbitrators, this is what they do for a living. Arbitration cases is not a full-time job. This court or this investment court system would not be a full-time job. The first years, it's even likely there will be no cases whatsoever because you have to wait for the treaty to enter into force, then things have to happen, and only then you might have a dispute. So what you're actually asking this for experts in this field to do is to quit their current job, get on a list, be paid a relatively small uh, retainer, and just you know, have no other or very few other job options in your field of specialization. And I for one doubt whether that is a wise thing to do because many people who are experts will say, well, no, thank you, just you know, to sit there and waggling my fingers hoping a case will come across, that is just not, um, not worth it. The next point is composition, subject matter expertise, and um, diversity. One element that has been added to the system is that you can um, sit in a case of which you are, whether the defending state, that you're a, a national of the defending state. The logical reason for that is if you think of TTIP and you would exclude anyone who's from the US or anyone from Europe, well, that might be very good for Israeli arbitration experts because it excludes most of the experts that are currently around. So in that way, it can be um, supported that nationality should not be a bar. On the other hand, it means that somebody may on the, be on the tribunal who is actually um, a national and in some cases even affiliated with the government who is defending a case. And you could wonder whether that is um, a wise approach. When it comes to expertise, the Commission has said, well, the, these members, these uh, adjudicators need demonstrated expertise in public international law and it is desirable that they have some experience in international investment law. Now, I think that is very worrying if the very field you're supposed to be the highest court in is merely, it merely desirable that you know something about that field. I don't think we would expect that from other judges, if you have family court judges, that it's merely desirable that they know something about family law. Also in other international uh, tribunals, think of the World Trade Organization, you have to know international trade law. 
Um, so this can be, um, I think this is a very worrying point. And finally, if you read any of the statements of the Commission about diversity, they are full of good intentions. If you actually look at the draft of the investment court system, there's nothing about um, any kind of adequate gender or geographic distribution. That is not to say that male judges from, from large countries might not be very good judges. They probably are, but one of the main critiques against the current system is precisely that it works as an exclusion mechanism against, for example, people from smaller countries or against women. So that is one critique that the Commission in its press releases aims to address. If you actually look at the treaties themselves, um, you don't find uh, anything in that regard. Moving to actually running the system, first of all, one worry is currently under arbitration you have uh, one shot, if you lose your case, you lose your case, that's it. In this system, you would have an appeal. And if you have an appeal procedure, the problem is, of course, that that risks doubling the time it takes. And one of the most important reasons for taking this international route is precisely because it is uh, supposed to be shorter. There are certain uh, time limits in place. Um, if you're interested, I would refer you to, to the text of the, of the treaty. Um, these time limits are quite reasonable. The only worrying element there is that there is no ramification if tribunals do not respect those time limits. So if the decision doesn't come out after, for example, 30 months for the appeal, there's nothing you can do as a party and waiting for two and a half years, if your business is going down the drain, this might just be very, um, very long. Another element is, well, this will get very, very expensive. Again, one of the reasons for arbitration is, well, the idea is you have only one instance, so you don't have first instance case, you have to pay your lawyers appeal, you have to pay your lawyers. In some countries, you can go to the Supreme Court. Again, that costs uh, quite a bit. In this system, the idea is that um, the costs would be borne by the losing party. And then that really deviates from the current practice because the, uh, in the current practice, usually costs are shared. In the new system, if a claimant would lose the case, they would pay for all the costs involved. However, if claimants win, that would mean the state has to pay all the costs. So the punishment for the state, who then would not only have to pay the procedural costs of, of running the tribunal, but also of the lawyers of the claimant, in addition to the compensation that is awarded, the punishment for the state would potentially get uh, much more. Of course, looking at it from an investor's perspective, this is great because if you have a good claim, you will actually get all your money back. Um, so in, in that regard, if you're thinking from the perspective of Israeli investors, this might actually be a very um, good change. Another element that is for which the current system is criticized and that ICS does not or not really address is the access for small and medium-sized companies. It's often not the biggest companies who need some form of you know, enforcement for their rights. It's often the smaller ones. A big company has means of leverage that are not linked to an adjudicatory system. A smaller company does not have that. So maybe for them it was um, needed most and for them very little is included. The next point is transparency. Within international arbitration, uh, the UNCTRAL has developed rules for transparency, meaning that there should not only be information about an ongoing case, but also, or about the outcome of the case, the award, but also about the ongoing case. There should be potential for um, listening in uh, to the hearings. That has now been adopted. I think that is one of the strong points of, these, uh, of, of the new system, that it will definitely be more transparent than most domestic courts. And in this um, running the ICS uh, section, I would like to raise one final point, um, that is third party participation. This is very new. Uh, not so much that you could have, um, well, yeah, well, there are other systems where you can have amicus curiae, friends of the court who contribute to what they think should be you know, part of the legal argument. But also the home state of the investor would have a say, and also other parties, be it natural or legal persons, who can establish a direct and present interest in the case. 
Now, on the one hand, this is a welcome development because it means that also uh, trade unions, industry federations, NGOs who have something to contribute would be welcome to do so. On the other hand, just putting it in there without, without adding any kind of framework, I don't think is a good, uh, a good choice. There is no code of conduct for these third party participants, for example. Think of leaking documents uh, that are confidential because there will still be a provision for those. It, there's also no restriction in terms of what they can submit in terms of pages or in terms of, of, of uh, time limits for them to do so. And if you think about it, these cases are expensive. If an NGO submits a document uh, unasked by the parties, unasked by the tribunal, that is, let's say, 100 pages, why not ask that NGO to pay a contribution? Because this discussing this document will cost both to the tribunal and to um, the parties. The last element, uh, or the last phase I wanted to discuss very briefly is um, how do you appeal this? How do you enforce these decisions? As I already said, there would be an appellate mechanism. Um, the fear is a bit that everybody will then start appealing. If you look at the World Trade Organization, that's not necessarily the case. In the beginning, yes, but it uh, grows gradually less. As the Commission has envisaged this appeal, it's a very broad appeal, so not only on the law, but also on facts. And personally, one downside is I think that um, it was a waste of time and resources that currently the system requires that you go first to the first instance tribunal, then you go to the appeal. If the appeal tribunal decides to um, modify the award, it has to go back to the original tribunal and they have to rewrite it. I think this last step is um, completely useless. The tribunal, the appeal tribunal could just as well itself um, rewrite the award. With regard to enforcement, the Commission has determined or proposes that any of these decisions, awards coming out of ICS, should be recognized by everyone. And I think it's quite, um, you can at least put some question marks whether domestic courts of third countries, let's say an agreement between the US and EU, and the claimant tries to enforce that in Israel, it's a bit strange that this would be binding, this determination that this is a, a final award that cannot be uh, refuted would be also binding on uh, domestic courts. So in conclusion, is the system more just? I think definitely some improvements have been made in terms of transparency, in terms of providing for an appellate mechanism. I think also it ra definitely raises some uh, problems which I have outlined. How realistic is this? Well, will we actually have this? I would say the chances, I wouldn't have said this last year, but gradually it becomes clear that a number of countries actually accept this. So Canada and Vietnam have already incorporated it in their treaties with uh, the EU. Mexico and Singapore have indicated they're definitely willing to discuss it. Only the US at this point is saying they do not, do not want it. And then finally, one uh, sentence about the uh, multilateral investment court system. Of course, it would make more sense rather than having one of these ICS systems for each treaty to have a multilateral one. But this is um, more a dream for the future. And I think this is also something that, and now it comes to the importance for Israel, that Israel should think about, uh, not just be a a rule maker, uh, not a rule taker, but a rule maker and to help decide how this reform, because there will be a reform, but how exactly this reform uh, will take shape. Thank you very much.